Thank you so much for joining me today here on Robert's Guitar Dungeon. Today is going to be a little bit different style of video from the content that I normally bring you. And the reason why is because I had the experience of a lifetime just 48 hours ago. And I would really like to share it with you. As best I can, anyway. You know, like a typical fanboy at a concert, uh, you know, of course, you know, I was taking video with my phone and taking pictures with my phone as best I can, you know, just to preserve some memories, you know, and a lot of people will take those and just, you know, upload them straight to YouTube and, uh, you know, off you go. But I wanted to add a little bit, uh, a little bit of my own, uh, my own experience and my own emotions that were going on along with it. You see, most of you know that I am a diehard Metallica fan. Metallica are my all-time favorite band. Uh, I have credited James Hetfield many, many times on this channel and other forums as being my primary inspiration for picking up the guitar for the very first time uh, when I was about eight years old. You know, unfortunately, the last time I got to see Metallica live in person was back in 1991 when they were on tour for the Black Album. That was about a two-year-long tour uh, that they were opening, uh, you know, they were sharing headlining duties with Guns N' Roses at that time who were touring behind their uh, User Illusion records. And, uh, you know, Faith No More was their special guest opener. Um, they have been around to the Indianapolis area several times since then, and every time they've come around, something has gotten in the way for me. Um, you know, be it, uh, you know, didn't have the money, you know, I had something else scheduled that I, you know, I couldn't make it happen. Um, you know, a number of things, you know, the most, uh, recent occurrence of this was when the, uh, it was when tickets were going on sale for this particular show. Uh, the show that took place here two days ago, two nights ago, on uh, March 11th, 2019. Uh, the, this show was announced and tickets went on sale a year in advance. Uh, so this time last year when tickets were on sale, I had been back to work for about a month. And uh, after coming off about four months worth of unemployment, and uh, I simply had no business buying concert tickets at that time. You know, so I chalked it up to another opportunity that I was just going to have to miss out on. All was not lost because, uh, you know, here just 48 hours prior to uh, to that, uh, this past Saturday night, you know, I, this this past year for Christmas, I was able to buy uh, buy my wife tickets to her favorite artist, who's you know her favorite artist, Mariah Carey. By the way, those of you that uh, that do not know me or my wife, uh, you might be interested to find out that she is a phenomenal phenomenal singer and Mariah Carey is her idol and she's never gotten to see her so I got the opportunity to buy her uh Mariah Carey tickets this past year for Christmas and uh, that show was this past Saturday night so you know getting to take her to do that and uh and and see the uh see her have an absolute blast you know made it oh made it okay that I was gonna have to miss Metallica Sunday night you know we uh you know we go out and have a great time you know Sunday comes and goes uh, you know, I was kind of hoping maybe a miracle might come my way, but it never did. Uh, Monday, I go back to work, pretty much writing it off. Six o'clock rolls around, and uh, it's quitting time for me at work. And as I'm walking out the door, I see a text message and a missed phone call, a recent missed phone call just in the last couple of minutes uh, from a, a particular friend of mine who also happens to be about as big of a Metallica fan as I am. And the only re I could only think of one reason why he would be calling me at the on the day at the time of that day that he was calling me. So I called him back and sure enough he says, "If you still want to go, I got a ticket for you." Huh, interesting. So, I called Mrs. Jackson and uh, ran it by her and uh, to make sure that she was okay with it. She said, "You're not going to get another opportunity like that. Go have a good go, have a good time." And I will see you when you get home. So I got the car and drove down to the venue. You know, they were playing at a venue here in Indianapolis called the Banker's Life Fieldhouse, uh, which is the big arena here in town. That's where the Indiana Pacers play. Uh, the uh, Banker's Life Fieldhouse actually replaced uh, the old Market Square Arena here, I don't know, probably about 15 years or so ago now. But uh, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful arena. As I'm driving downtown to uh, Banker's Life Fieldhouse, you know, I called Chris back and said, I got the green light. And he said, OK, cool. I'm sending you the ticket. So, you know, he sent it to me electronically. I looked down on my phone and uh, as I'm driving, there it is. OK, cool. So I find a place to park, which was not easy. Um, 
you know, I got lucky and there was actually an Arby's parking. There's actually an Arby's in downtown Indianapolis, real close to the venue that was uh, allowing people to park there for five bucks. Uh, and the, the actual parking lot right next to it was charging 20. So I was lucky and got a $5 parking spot um, and uh, walked a couple blocks up to Banker's Life. And as I'm standing in line uh, waiting to get in, I, I was pulling up, getting my ticket info ready so that they could scan it without uh, me holding up the line behind me. And uh, that's when I noticed that uh, this particular ticket was not just any ticket. This ticket happened to be a floor seat. All of a sudden it hit me that I am about to be standing closer to my all-time favorite band, the arguably the biggest and most popular metal band in the history of this planet. And more importantly, the guy that inspired me to pick up a guitar from the get-go. Check out this clip here and see if you can imagine the adrenaline rush that I was feeling as I was watching this from my vantage point.
Now, before you get nervous that you're getting ready to watch every single song that they played, because they played a full 18 song set, uh, they played a, not 18 songs in two and a half hours. Uh, and man, it was a great show. It was an unbelievable show. I don't know how they've got the stamina to do that. Um, but before you get worried, you know, unfortunately, you know, but you have to remember a half hour before I arrived at the venue, I was not planning on being there at all. So, you know, I had a phone, you know, my phone was only at about maybe 50% when I got there. So I had very, very limited, uh, you know, it was very limited what I could and could not do with my, with my phone, particularly video, um, you know, among other things. And I didn't even get to bring my kazoo with, with me you know, to hopefully maybe have them sign it. <laughs> Now, there, if there was one thing that I did that I really wish that I could take back, it was right about at this point in the show as we were leading into the second, uh, leading into the second song. I was uh, standing, you know, down there on the floor. You know, there's maybe just a few people uh, here between me and, and uh, the barricade. You know, I was having the time of my life. I didn't think I was ever going to get to do this. And meanwhile, some dude that I didn't know with, you know, young, young kid, uh, you know, probably in his, you know, mid twenties, maybe came, walked in and, you know, kind of bulldozed his way up right in front of me. And I mean, right in front of me, long, dark hair and, you know, stood right here. Literally. I was that, I was that close to him with nowhere to go behind me. And he's, you know, doing this and he's, he's head banging and whipping his hair around you know, his hair cape keeps whipping me in the face. And, you know, I'm kind of doing one of these as best I can. And finally, after about five minutes of this, you know, that finally I reached up and grabbed his hair. And then he kind of turned around and looked at me and, you know, didn't know what was going on. I said, you've been whipping me in the face with your hair, with your hair for the last five minutes. I'm done with it. And you know, right about that time, that's when the band started playing the next song. And it was too loud to have a, you know, have any further conversation. Um when it quieted down again, he came up to me and, uh, you know, said, you know, sorry about that. There's another problem. You know, there's a problem. Just have me on the shoulder, but don't grab my hair. Uh, you know, and I got to thinking about it. And he was right. I definitely overreacted in that particular instance. And I really wanted to catch up with him after the show. Um, he spoke with, I think, a Scottish accent, too, which, you know, he went, he, <laughs> if that's where he lives, he came a long way for a Metallica show. But um, I kind of been keeping my eye on him throughout the show. Uh, because I really wanted to catch up with him afterwards. And, uh, you know, we did apologize right there. You know, he said he apologized for hitting me in the face with his hair. And I told him I apologized for, you know, for grabbing his hair and, you know, being a dick. But, you know, I really kind of wanted to have a more formal, meaningful apology than what he got from me. So, you know, if anybody sees this guy and knows who it is that I'm talking about, you know, please direct him to this video. Uh, because, you know, that is one thing, again, that I really, really, uh, you know, I'm not real proud of how I handled that situation. So, and I would like the opportunity to apologize to him one more time if I could. Anyway, but that's right about when the band started playing this tune.
man, there was a lot. There were so many cool things throughout Metallica's history that I got to have a first, not just you know, just a first person uh, witness, you know, uh, you know, a first person experience with, but one right up and and personal with all of those guys. Uh, you know, one of James's more famous recent guitars uh, is the one that they named Carl, and uh, it is made from the. Uh, and thank you to uh, my friend Lee Canales for uh, for telling me this story. Um, but you know, it, it's a, it's an ESP guitar that's uh, you know that's a snake bite body style, but it's made from uh, from the old lumber from the garage that they wrote the music to write the lightning in. Uh, you know, the garage of that particular house. You know, apparently that house was torn down. I mean, it's to salvage enough of the lumber, and uh, they built a guitar out of it. Uh, for James, and they named it Carl because the house, I believe, was on Carlton Street. Uh, but James played that guitar quite a bit throughout the night, uh, and I was fortunate to get some uh, some really up close photos. There was a lot of guitar changes throughout the night. You know, I think Rob Trujillo changed basses just about every single song. Uh, you know, one of his Warwicks that was like this, you know, sh silver like like glossy shiny silver uh warwick something or other with a couple of single coil pickups in it was really really cool you know but there's lots of guitar changes throughout the night for both of those guys uh, both james and kirk uh james as i mentioned or you know played the carl's the, the, uh he played carl he played uh you know so he played he played an explorer at one point uh one time he had a flying v out and uh you know several other uh esp snake bites you know, Kirk, on the other hand, had a pretty diverse, you know, had a, an even more uh, diverse collection of guitars that he was using. You know, probably I th you know the, the most notable one that he had that caught my attention uh, more than any of them was this Cherry Burst, old Cherry Burst Les Paul, that he is not real well known for playing. However, he has been in the news in recent guitar form because, if I'm not mistaken, this particular guitar is a '59 Les Paul. Uh, this, you know, the uh, the burst, if you will, and uh, and and, the re and I say that because it's I can tell at one it's you know it's a cherry burst that's been faded out a little bit. But uh, this guitar once belonged to Gary Moore, and uh, Kirk Hammett actually just recently acquired it here in the last year or so, and you know paid. You know, I, I think he paid upwards of seven figures for it, probably more. Uh, you know, he it was a lot of money, and you know he was real happy and real excited about it when he bought it. You know, it just kind of looked strange seeing him playing a uh, you know playing a Cherry Burst Les Paul because I've seen him play customs and stuff like that all over the place. You know, but never seen him with a regular regular burst, at least not on stage. And you know, here it is, and all of a sudden it hit me. So I bet you that's the Gary Moore. Les Paul that he just bought not too long ago. Uh, he played that guitar. Of course, he had his uh, you know his various collection of uh, ESP uh, KH guitars. The uh, you know he, one of them was like a like a pink, uh, not pink, but it was like a uh, uh, like a mauve type of uh, type of color that was a sparkly mauve. Uh, it was a real interesting finish. Um, you know, of course, he had lots of them that had the, you know his. Uh, he's kind of getting famous for the horror movie. Uh, graphics on his guitars. Uh, he played a Strat on "Nothing Else Matters," which was uh, which was very interesting. You know, Sunburst looked like a standard Strat, and uh, you know his uh, he's his uh, Jackson Rhodes V. He played he played a Jackson Rhodes. You know, he's been known to break out of Jackson Rhodes for a number of years, and you know, I had a real close up view of Kirk with that guitar over his shoulder, and that guitar is beat up. Uh, I didn't realize that it was that banged up, so it makes me wonder if that's not the same one that he was, uh, that he's been playing since back in the you know the early, uh, late '80s, early '90s. He's been breaking out of flying, you know, a, a Rhodes V rather, uh, on tours for decades now. So that makes me wonder if it's not the same one. If it is, it must be a great guitar. Yeah, you know, they played a pretty diverse set list as well. And uh, I know that uh, I know from you know from uh, hearsay anyway from friends of mine that went to see them on the Death Magnetic tour that most of what they played on the Death Magnetic tour, which is about ten years ago now, uh, most of what they played on that was songs from the Death Magnetic album. You know, they threw in a few of the you know a few of the classics, but it was just about all Death Magnetic. You know, this time around, they played five songs off of uh, off the new rock, new record, Hardwired to Self Destruct. Uh, of course, they played the title track. That's actually the one they opened with, uh, as you saw earlier. Uh, they played Atlas Rise. They played uh, Moth into Flame, of course. 
that was funny. <laughs> I'll tell you that story in a second. Um, you know, they played Atlas Rise. They played Moth in the Flame. Uh, you know, they played Now That We're Dead and uh, the song with Revenge in the title, which uh, the title of that song escapes me. But but that one was actually cool because they had a spot in the middle where all four of them got up. They had these risers on the stage uh, that were kind of lowering and, you know, coming up and coming and, and lowering back down. And uh, this time there was four of them that just rose out of the, uh, uh, out of the stage on all four corners around the drum kit and uh Lars got out from behind the drum kit they each uh Rob set his bass down and uh you know Kirk and James kind of slung their guitars behind them they were each sitting at one of these uh pillars uh that I'm assuming each one each one had a drum trigger of some kind in it and uh with drumsticks and they were all playing drums you know beating you know the drum beat together you know in the middle of this and they did that for you know for a solid minute or two which was really really cool you know James Hetfield by the way if you didn't know is actually a an excellent drummer <laughs> later on in the show as i mentioned they played uh you know they they played moth in the flame and of the of the, all the songs particularly the hits off of the latest album that's the one that i really wanted to hear the most and uh you know the, it was kind of funny because when they first started playing it uh you know kirk came in a you know a full measure too early and uh when that happened james was uh, james actually happened to be standing right in front of where i was and you know, James kind of looked over at him as he was still playing where he was supposed to be, and he kind of looked over at Kirk, and then Kirk realized that James was looking over at him and looked back, and then they kind of had this moment, and they just started laughing. Finally, Kirk goes, <laughs> and they all got a good laugh, and that's when James told everybody that they're each allowed one mistake, you know, one mistake a night, and uh, <laughs> that apparently was Kirk's, because uh, he did play phenomenally throughout the entire show, uh, but, you know, before anybody goes and gives Kirk Hammond a hard time about that, come on, let's be realistic, you're not a real musician if you've never done that. Every single, you know, <laughs> any real musician out there, especially if you're playing in front of people, you, you've done that at least a time or two in your life, you know, and they were all able to laugh about it and you know we were all we were all able to laugh about it uh, you know and then they restarted the song and it sounded great on this particular tour they were uh you know setting aside a spot in the show uh where they would play you know a, a cover at least you know a part of a cover from a, a band that came from the local area that they're playing in uh they had their work cut out for them in indianapolis because you know even if you take the entire state of indiana into account they had, you know, there's, there, unfortunately, there has not been very many, uh, very many well-known musical artists that have come out of the state of Indiana. You know, realistically, you know, their choices are Axl Rose, uh, David Lee Roth, you know, both of those guys are from Lafayette, Indiana, but, you know, let's face it, both those, you know, Guns N' Roses and Van Halen, those are both L.A. bands, and, uh, yeah, so, you know, so you had Axl Rose, David Lee Roth, uh, John Mellencamp, and for me, I mean, that's, you know, you know, that's, you're digging real deep at that point. So, you know, they did play, uh, part of a John Mellencamp song, and, uh, you know, it was, in, it was, you could tell Rob and Kirk were literally trying to, you know, they were basically learning it, you know, the main riff to it on the fly. I think it was, you know, Jack and Diane or something like that, one of those, one of those tunes, uh, but, uh, you know, he was, pretty much learning it on the fly and you know which is which is impressive in and of itself but you know they, they played about 30 seconds or so of that song and uh they also played part of a song from a you know a punk band from indiana uh that i had never heard of but they mentioned it was from 1980 i'll have to look up and see you know the name of the band and again i'll post that down on the screen here once i figure it out uh you know they so they played a couple of punk riffs uh, or a couple of riffs from this punk band, which was, you know, which was interesting. Uh, I kind of would have liked to have seen them, you know, seen what they would have pulled out, you know, had they been in, uh, you know, Nashville or, uh, you know, a number of other, number of other cities, Atlanta, you know, that have produced uh, some really well-known artists over the years. But, you know, hats off to, you know, them doing their homework at least, uh, you know, and digging deep. You know, they I imagine they had to, uh, like I said, the pickings were slim. The pyro, as I mentioned earlier, was amazing. The light show was amazing. Um, 
you know, unlike anything I had ever experienced, they had this, uh, you know, when, as I mentioned, they were, when they were playing Moth in the Flame, they had these probably 50 drones that all came up out of the stage and were flying around, uh, swarming around the stage, if you will, and each one had a little light on it, you know, so you could tell what they were. But, uh, you know, as they were all, you know, swarming around the stage as they were playing the song, it was really, really cool, you know, and then when the song was over, you know, they all kind of lowered back down into the stage. You know, whoever designed the uh, the the light show and you know, and all the everything that goes into the stage act, uh, I mean, it's some serious high tech, <laughs> you know, high level engineering, and uh, I got to assume that that individual is paid very very well. A friend of mine shared this headline with me here uh, the the morning after the show. And, you know, every time that uh, I bring up Metallica in like a Facebook thread or something, there's always somebody on my, uh, somebody out there on my friends list that's got to, you know, be, you know, the Metallica hater and start, you know, jacking their jaws and, you know, saying a whole bunch of negative stuff about it. The most recent one, somebody referred to them as Money Talica, which drove me, which just absolutely drives me insane. You know, yeah, they've got money and they've got a lot of it, but... You know what? They're also the most popular metal band that's ever walked this planet, and I think they've earned it. And even you know, it's not like they should have to apologize for that. Oh, and by the way, that article that I mentioned, uh, somebody, you know, a, another good friend of mine sharing with me. Uh, you see this? They're actually giving money away to people that need it. You know, this happened right after the show, pretty much. You know, they had gone backstage and changed into t-shirts. That's about, and that's right about when it happened. You know, I mentioned before they had they played a pretty diverse set list. They played the five songs from the uh, from the latest album that I mentioned. You know, they played uh, you know of course a few songs from the Black album. Uh, you know, like they played uh, you know Unforgiven. They actually closed with Inner Sandman, and uh, you know nothing else matters. You know, so of course you know this. Uh, oh, and uh, Sad but True. So of course the Staples. Uh, from that record, nothing from Load. They played nothing from Load. The only song that they played from Reload was Fuel. Uh, Fuel was definitely the best performance of the night, even though it's not necessarily one of my favorite Metallica songs. Uh, it was definitely the best performance, and that's that was the first time the Pyro came out, uh, which is where this photo, when this photo was taken, and uh, you know if you look closely, you might be able to see Lars, you know, you know Lars's neck hair getting singed in the, uh, you know, right there in the middle of all of that. You know, that was the only song that they played off of either of the Load records. Uh, they played nothing off of Saint Anger. They played nothing off of Death Magnetic, and uh, the everything else was all classic stuff off of the uh, the first four records. You know, which of course is what I really, really wanted to see. The only, you know, really the only thing that you know, of course, there's a lot of stuff that I would have loved to have heard them play, but uh, you know, there's only so much time that they have. Uh, but they did not play Fade to Black, which is my very favorite Metallica song. And, uh, the, unfortunately they didn't play it, but you know, it, it uh, everything else th that they played more than made up. So right. overall it was absolutely the experience of a lifetime. Uh, I'll be honest, I'm making this video more for me than I am, uh, you know, for anybody else as a way to document, you know, all of this, because I'm not a guy that gets to cross a lot of stuff off of his bucket list, but getting to see Metallica and my guitar hero, James Hetfield, uh, from the front row is no longer on it. And I even got to acquire one of James Hetfield's guitar picks as a souvenir. This is this is a pretty cool guitar pick. It's got uh, the Metallica uh, artwork there on one side, and then on the other side, it of course has the famous M, Metallica M, with Indianapolis 311 2019 on it. Pretty cool. Uh, and by the way, I damn near dislocated my shoulder diving for this thing. And I even had to pry off a couple of other hands that were, once I did get my hand on it, I even had to pry off a couple of other hands to, you know, to make sure they didn't take it from me. And unfortunately in that, oh, you know what? I just now noticed this has got, a, also got a picture of, uh, it's got the, that's pretty awesome. This has a picture of like the, the Screaming Heads uh, artwork on the cover of the Hardwired album, but on the inside of it, it's actually got a, got a picture of uh downtown indianapolis and uh specifically 
the outside of the building of St. Elmo's Steakhouse, which is a very famous steakhouse here in Indianapolis. Um, World-class steakhouse, by the way. Uh, not cheap. I imagine that's probably where they had dinner. But uh, that's awesome. I just now noticed that. But thank you so much to my friend Chris for giving me the opportunity to experience this. Uh, unlike anything I have ever had, you know, I've ever gotten to experience, I was in tears the minute that the Ecstasy of Gold started to play because I didn't think I was even going to get to be there, much less get to have the experience that I did have. Also, thank you to uh, my childhood, one of my childhood best friends, uh, Trey, who I grew up with uh, down, in, uh, down in Houston, Texas. Uh, Trey gave me my very first Metallica records, uh, when I was seven years old and, uh, I've been a fan ever since, you know, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you have enjoyed this video as much as I have enjoyed making it. Uh, again, this, I know this is something a little bit different from what you are used to seeing from me. Maybe not exactly what you subscribe to, but, uh, still, uh, an, you know, guitar related, if you will. And, uh, you know, if you'd like to see more stuff like this, let me know. You know, of course, uh, you know, applicable links down in the description, comments uh, section down below that. Uh, please consider hitting the subscribe button if you have not already. Let's check out one more clip from the stage show on the way out. Thank you so much for watching.